My real reason for being here is that I have the honor of introducing our keynote speaker today. You know him, you've seen him, we all know this gentleman. In his first, his first college game, he had 32 rebounds. That's a college career for a lot of guys. 32 rebounds in his very first game, which of course stands as a record for the Tigers. He became the school's all-time leading rebounder at that time with nearly 1,300 boards over the course of his career. Uh, that's not only a chart stopper, and he's also at that time of his playing days, the number two scorer behind Pistol Pete. And I know you didn't get to touch the ball nearly as much as he did, so that explains a lot of that. Much of his success, including his All-America season in 1981, came after returning from a serious foot injury that forced him to miss all but two games of the 78-79 season. Not only did he return, but he returned in grand fashion. In 1981, he was named Southeastern Conference Player of the Year and led the Tigers to their first NCAA Final Four appearance in nearly 30 years. So what an accomplishment there. In his four years, LSU had records, now get this, 18 and 9, 23 and 6, 26 and 6, and a remarkable 31 and 5. The Tigers won one SEC title, an SEC tourney championship, got to the Elite Eight and to the Final Four during his tenure. Then he moved on to the NBA, drafted by the Atlanta Hawks, and played in the NBA for three years there. In 2000, he was honored as the school's living legend at the SEC basket, basketball tournament. And in 2005, he was elected to the Louisiana Sports Hall of Fame. But maybe the biggest honor, in my view, is this one. Just a few years ago, his number 40 was hung from the rafters at the PMAC with only three other names, Pistol Pete, Shaquille O'Neal, and Bob Pettit. That is remarkable. And after his college and professional career, then he settled down to more serious business. He's now currently serving as the executive director of the Governor's Council on Physical Fitness and Sports, and he is also the head of the Bureau of Minority Health Access and Promotions. And I gotta tell you, that's part that's not in my prepared, prepared script. My first chance of uh, meeting with this uh, young man, he's younger than I am, was almost 20 years ago. And I must say that our keynote speaker truly is a champion of the local community. He gives up his time as much as anyone could possibly do. And here's the perfect example. It was just almost 20 years ago, we're at a little mom's club over in Denham Springs at a, we'll call it a fashion show. It was more like t-shirts from JC Penney's. But that is the kind of gentleman he is in that he gives back to the community. Yeah, maybe he's Kentucky born, but he's Louisiana proud. He's purely and absolutely an ambassador for our state. Gentlemen and ladies, please join me in welcoming our keynote speaker, Rudy Macklin. Man, introduction like that, I feel like I'm gonna get back out there, man, and play some more. Man. <laughs> oh man, what an honor to be here, and I'm just thankful to be here. I was uh, one of your uh, original committee members back in the day when they first formed uh, the Men's Health uh, uh, Conference, and so uh, it's just good to see 14 years later it's still going strong. Uh, I had to move on because I had one office at the time when we uh, formed the committee, and now I have two. And so uh, my schedule is really Full every year, every minute, pretty much, and uh, uh, I travel the entire state and sometimes the country doing what I do with the uh, Governor's Council on Fitness and also with the Bureau of Minority Health. It's been really, uh, really exhausting at times, but it's uh, well needed in this state because of the problems we have with the uh, high rates of illness and disease and death in the state of Louisiana, which makes my job even more complex. And so, uh, but I'm glad to be here. 
Uh, unlike Curtis Chastain, you know, my blood pressure is fine. Now, he said he don't run around and do bad things and chase women. Well, I'm the opposite. <laughs> That's why I don't have high blood pressure. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I like to cheat, uh, tease Curtis every now and then. But uh, I'm sorry I had some uh, a PowerPoint presentation, but uh, my, uh, my uh, program is not compatible to the computer here. And, man, I tell you, I have some great pictures for you. Now, if you fall asleep while I'm talking, it's not my fault because I had the pictures up there would have kept you from falling asleep. I had the advanced copy of the swimsuit issue of Sports Illustrated, right? So, <laughs> so therefore, y'all don't get a chance to see that. So, uh, but anyway, um, I'm from Louisville, Kentucky, okay? Uh, basketball is king there, uh, the home of the great Muhammad Ali. And so uh, coming to Louisiana was a... Uh, cultural shock in, in a sense, but uh, uh, I made a decision to come and uh, when I came I, I, I learned something very valuable which relates to why you all here today. And so I want to talk to you all today just briefly. I'm not going to be long. I'm not one of those long-winded guys. I'm sorry. I'm just not like that. Uh, but I want to talk to you all about sharing the weight. Sharing the weight of what you go through every day. Sharing the weight of all the things you have, you come across that make you, that weight makes you not take care of yourself. Sometimes that weight makes you not be proactive and do the preventive things you need to do to keep your health in check. That weight can really hold you down. And we as men, we have a tough time sharing that weight. We try to carry that weight on us all the time. And, and I always wonder, why is that? And, and I wonder because, you know, my own self, I learned, I had to think back, where did that weight come from? Why was that weight there? And I had to go back even further because in Louisville, Kentucky, uh, my big brother, Al, he was the Duke of the Block. Now, the Duke of the Block back then in Kentucky is you were the baddest guy on your block. All right? And so him and his crew, their job was to protect all the other kids under them and my sisters and all the girls on the block from all the other bad kids from the other blocks, okay? And plus from the housing project around the corner. So his job was to protect everybody in the block. So I'm, little, I'm Big Mac's little brother, Little Mac. And so as Little Mac, I'm gonna look up to my big brother. And my big brother said, if you're gonna be like me, you gotta be tough, okay? You gotta learn to take pain. You got to learn not to show weakness. You got to learn to make sure that you don't cry because big boys don't cry. Okay, and the biggest thing he said was, you can't be weak and cry in front of girls. You can't cry in front of girls, okay? So you got to be tough. You got to hold on to your pain and don't show weakness. He said, because we are lions. The guys on the other blocks, they're the hyenas. And the hyenas look to see if there is a weakness, and just like in the jungle, the hyenas, when they see a weak lion, they attack him. Okay, so whenever we go to other blocks, I had to make sure I could hold my own. He taught me how to defend myself. And whenever you got hurt in the playground or in the streets, you had to make sure you don't run home to get a Band-Aid. Okay, you had to show that you can bleed because bleeding was a badge of honor. Because if you showed that you couldn't bleed in front of your boys, they would say, well, we're going to have to regulate you down to playing hopscotch with the girls. Okay, and that was a no-no, all right? That's the way it was. And then we'd ride our bikes all the way to Shawnee Park, which was forbidden by our parents, because we want to have a chance to see the champ. We wanted to see Muhammad Ali in his convertible ca uh, Cadillac, throwing out his rhymes, talking about how tough he was, and that was the thing. We all had to be tough. We all had to hold our own. I'm like, why is that? You know, why is it I, I just want to play marbles every day, okay? Why is it I got to be tough and hold my own all the time and to prevent everybody from coming over to take over our block? But then my father was not a well man, okay? He was sick a lot. And he allowed my brother to do what he did to me because he wanted to prepare me for that weight, and I couldn't see it at the time, okay, to prepare me for that weight. And so when I saw him and what he went through, 
He never talked about his sickness. He had bronchitis, asthma, uh, bronchitis, he had bad allergies, and he coughed profusely all the time, spitting up phlegm all the time. And he'd always say, it'll be all right, it's gonna pass. You know, I never saw him go to the doctor, all right? I never saw him take a vacation, all right? I never hear him talk about his illness at all. He always wanted to have a front. He always wanted to have, show everybody outside the home how strong he was, how he can take care of his family. He worked long hours all the time, never saw him take a day off, and cut grass on the side to make extra money and used to take me along with him. So I said, well, dad is always sick all the time. But when you see him out somewhere, he's like, he's fine. He don't want nobody to know, okay? And so he wanted to instill that in his children, especially his sons, okay? So he wanted us to show the rest of the world or the city that Macklin men, okay? That was his thing, Macklin men, all right, can hold that weight, okay? But he never taught us how to share that weight. So when I, got, when I started playing basketball, this weight was reinforced because when you're playing basketball, my coaches would say, don't let them see you hurt out there, okay? I'm in junior high school now. And I'm like, okay, so if I get hurt or get the flu or sick, or get sick, the flu or something, they expect you to play. They expect you to get out there. Put them in the whirlpool, they say. Get them some ice, that's it. Put them back out there, you know? And you had to go out. So why is it I have to play hurt? I'm, I'm, my ankle's swollen up bigger than my head, you know, and I'm out there trying to play. But I realized that weight, that weight was if I didn't play, what would happen to my team, okay? I'm the leading scorer, the leading rebounder on my team. I've never been on a losing team in my life. I've been playing and contending for championships since the eighth grade. So now I have that weight on me because I have to carry my team, okay? I couldn't, didn't have time to get the flu. Didn't have time for that. Didn't have time to take on a sprained ankle, all right? Put ice on it, you get back out there. That weight was on me, okay? And then when I got to college, it became more necessary to play with that pain and carry that weight. I remember we played up against the Paul uh, on national television against my buddy Mark Aguirre and, uh, and Clyde Bradshaw, and uh, I sprained my ankle. And uh, the first two minutes of the game, and it was funny because underneath the basket was a whole section of pro scouts. So I know I wanted to show then, but I sprained my ankle. And when I went to the sideline, the first thing Coach Dale Brown said, you need to learn how to play with pain. If you're gonna be successful, on the bench, he's telling me this, if you expect to play in the NBA, you are gonna to have to learn to play with pain. That weight was getting heavier on me then. The more successful we got, that weight came upon me. And the thing is about it, you'd be surprised what you can do when you're hurting, how you can control your mind and convince yourself, no matter how bad off you are, you can still function. We played against Ole Miss one time in a critical game that was for the SEC championship. I had the flu real bad, real bad. Had a high temperature. Went out and had one of the best games of my career. You know, came back and threw a ball over the place and I was just sick, you know. And Coach Brown said, this is how it's supposed to be. But the thing about that weight that you carry is pretty lonely. It's a pretty lonely feeling because when you go back home and you're hurt and you're sick and you had to perform a particular task, mine was athletics at the time, whatever your task is, when you come home, you are pretty much alone with that weight. You got to put the ice on, you have to take your medicine, you have to be in bed. You know, and all these things, it's a lonely feeling because you don't want anybody to see that you're weak. You don't want anybody to know that you can't get up the next day and continue your task. But that weight will come upon you. And if you don't learn how to share that weight, it's really, really going to come back and haunt you. And it came back to haunt me. 
when I got drafted in the NBA, the weight came upon me because I collapsed in the third day of training camp and rookie camp. And they didn't know why my fluids were leaving my body so fast. Okay, they didn't have a name for it at the time. But later on, it's called hyperhidrosis. And I, I collapsed and I had cramps all over my body at the same time. You have a cramp in your leg, you know, in your arm. Try having a cramp everywhere at your body at the same time. Okay, they rushed me to the hospital, filled me up with IV. All right, then I wound up having to have IV two hours before I played, two hours after I played. Okay, that weight had to come back to haunt me because my father that carried that weight didn't tell me he had the same condition. Nobody in the family talked about family history, health issues. Nobody talked about the heart disease in the family, the diabetes, right? The prostate cancer, okay? High blood pressure, hypertension. All these things were going on in my family because all the men in the family carried that weight, okay? That was the weight that came back to haunt me. They didn't know why it happened to me. It never happened to me in high school. It never happened to me in college. But all of a sudden, I'm on the level, the dream of my, my dream, living my dream, and that weight came upon me. I never knew that my family had this condition. So, my first game in the NBA was against Dr. J, Julius Serving, the Philadelphia 76ers, my favorite player of all time. And my brother, the Duke of the Block, that's his favorite player too. I'm gonna show you how big brothers are. He said, hey little brother, look, uh, you know you're going up against our boy, huh? I said, yeah, he said, look, now, if he dunk on you, he said, just, just don't take it personal now, because he does it to everybody. So don't, don't just get in your mind if you just don't get caught up watching and become a sideshow. Because if he does dunk on you, you know I'm going to laugh at you, right? <laughs> I said, thank you, big brother. You know? And so I'm going out there. I had bad allergies, and I'm cramping off and on. Can't keep the fluids down. And I'm going up against the top player in the NBA. Now, I was trained by my brother and my father not to show weakness to be strong. Plus, on top of that, I'm scared to death because after all, it's Dr. J. <laughs> so, my coach, Kevin Lockery, said, now look, don't get caught up watching him. I said, well, there go, and coach, I gotta guard him? No, no, no. It's a different type of watching him because when he do things, it's like a sideshow. Okay, so if you get caught up watching him, you're in trouble. But just try to push him to his left and push him to your help, okay? And don't worry about it. If he dunk on you, he does it to everybody else. <laughs> I said, what is this thing about it does it to everybody else? So I'm scared to death. I'm sick. You know, I'm trying to play. So we go out to the game, and Dr. J gets the ball on the left side. He gives me a jab step. I went for the jab. He went up. I got by me. He got up against our seven foot two center, Tree Rollins. He went up. Tree bumped him. Tree came out of the air. Dr. J stayed in the air, pumped the ball, hit it off the glass. We at home and our fans are going crazy. <laughs> and I'm like, oh my God. So get down the floor. We got the ball. They throw an entry pass to me. I'm the starting small forward. He steals the ball. Tree Rollins, our seven foot two center again, is slow getting back. Dr. J hesitates and go, and he dunks on our seven foot two center. Tree Rollins came back to me and said, son of a, don't you ever, ever do that to me again. Do you know who that is? I said, well, Tree, he does it to everybody. <laughs> Why are you upset? <laughs> you know? He said, you're just a rookie. I said, I know, but he did it to me too. <laughs> so you, 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 you have to play with that. And then after I had, I, I outplayed him that game. Uh, and they beat us by one. And Dr. J, Dr. J said, I won't forget you. You know, he said, you, you got me. I won't forget you. And so I went back home. I was in such pain, you know, 
from the, from the cramping, had to get IVs, you know, my knees were hurting, and I mean, the pain was there. And then the weight came upon me because when you play in the NBA or any professional sport, and your contract is heavy with incentives by the number of minutes you play is the amount of money you get back then, like, not like right now with all those guaranteed contracts. You had to play. You had to have a pact with the trainer. It said, don't tell the coach whatever was wrong with me, put me back out there. Take me up, ice me down, put me back out there. I'm in the Boston Garden, the old Boston Garden where the cracks in the floors look great on TV, but there was the worst floors in the NBA. They had cracks, wide cracks in the dead wide. I'm chasing a loose ball with Larry Bird, right? And my foot get caught, crack, caught in the crack on the floor, and I break my toe, my big toe. And so I kind of left off the floor a little bit. I told the trainer, look now, you tape that big toe to the next toe. And you put my ass back out there. <laughs> you know, the, the contract said I got to play so many minutes. Okay? And so if you get injured and the coach see you injured, he won't, he'll be reluctant to put you back out there again, even when you're well. And as a rookie, I had to learn that. So even more, hiding my injuries, hiding my illnesses, not showing weakness made that weight even stronger. And when we got to the playoffs uh, against Boston and against Philadelphia, the weight became even more because every game, it goes up to another level. And I couldn't keep the fluids in me quick enough. And I always had to have IV. And then I started having back problems, okay? And so I'd always get my back treated as well, and you had to go back out there. No player that's ever played professional sports, everybody plays with something. They all play with injuries. You talk to any professional athlete, they always play with some major injury, but they have to keep going. But something happened. The weight on me was so strong when I got traded to the Knicks. You know, it was my contract year. I was about to sign the big one after that. Myself and Bernard King was on the same team. And I collapsed in training camp. I was in the hospital for two weeks. And then the doctor said, I don't think you'll be able to play this game again. I said, oh, really? I said, no, I can't accept that. I, I cannot accept that. And he said, does this run in your family? I'm like, well, I don't know. I'm not sure. And so I called my dad. I said, dad. Do you, do you cramp up a lot? Oh, yeah, son, I do, I do. I said, why come you didn't tell me? <laughs> well, you know, it don't seem to be as bad as yours. I said, but you should have told me. He said, well, you know what? Your sister got it, too. I said, my sister has it, too? I said, Dad, do you know what this is called? Is it a Charlie horse? No! <laughs> it's not a Charlie horse. It's hyperhidrosis. Oh. That's bad? Yeah, Dad, it's bad. I said, how come you didn't say anything? Well, I didn't think it would be that bad. I said, Dad, the doctors are telling me I don't look I'll be able to play ball anymore. Oh, son, I'm so sorry. I said, yeah, me too. This is my contract year. I'm about to sign the big one. So I refused to let anybody in. I didn't want nobody to know. I hid it as best I could. But when you hide your illnesses and your sickness, if you don't share the weight, sharing the weight means to me, you got to be willing to tell other people closest to you what you're going through. Because if you don't share the weight with them, your wife, your family members, your immediate brothers and sisters, if you don't share that weight with them, keeping all of that inside only makes it worse. Okay, mentally it makes it worse on you. Your, 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 Ill, your, whatever your illness is, your sickness is, it becomes 10 times worse because your mental frame of mind is, I got to keep this in. I can't worry my family. I don't want them to be worried. I don't want them to be worried about me thinking they got to take care of me. Because after all, I'm a Macklin. That was my problem. I'm a Macklin. Macklins don't show weakness. Macklin don't show, Macklins don't show pain. But then it got lonelier and lonelier with that weakness, that weight. 
So I had to learn to confide in those around me, those who love me the most, and say, I can't take this by myself. I no longer can handle this by myself. This weight is too much for me now because now they're telling me I can't play basketball anymore. I'm a starting guard in the NBA, and all of a sudden they're telling me I can't play anymore, all because of this weight that's on me. And so I couldn't accept it. I refused to accept it. I refused to accept the fact that I could not play ball anymore. So I hid it. And so when the Knicks said, we're going to let you go so we can, you can go and find out what's causing this, I spent a ton of money trying to find out how to keep my fluids from lose, leaving my body so fast. I went to specialists, nutritionists, everything. And so I took some time off, and so I said, i got to try again. So my agent said, why don't you, we're going to put you in the CBA, which is the minor league of NBA, and so you can kind of get back and get yourself together. He said, are you sure you want to try this? The doctor said, you can't play. I said, I have to do it. I have to do it. He said, what about your family? I said, I don't want them to know. I don't want my family to know. Let's keep this between us. The weight, I had to keep it with me. So I went to play for the Albany Patroons. Phil Jackson, that was his first head coaching job. He said that he needed a small forward, a swing man that could score. And he said, oh, you, you want to come play? I said, I didn't tell him about my condition. I hid it from Phil Jackson that whole time I was there. I told the trainer about my problem. I said, please don't tell the coach, all right? Just arrange for me to get IV before I play and arrange for me to get IV after I play. He said, you sure you want to do this? I said, I, I, I have to. I said, no Mackling is going to go down like this. And so we wind up winning the CBA championship. The Knicks wanted to bring me back, but the LA Clippers had offered me a better deal. So I signed with the LA Clippers, went to the training camp, and collapsed the third day. And the doctor said, you cannot play this game any longer. And you know, it was weird because they gave me all kind of tests. They had me squeeze a tennis ball and drew blood from my arm. And they put all these little sonogram things on me and put some little, turn the juice on, and I cramped up all over. The doctors ran out of the room scared. And I'm like, well, where are they going? You know, I'm screaming on the table like this, you know, and they run out of the room. And they all come in there and huddle around, you know, and about 10 of them and said, we've never seen anything like this before. I said, me either. <laughs> Tell me why this is happening to me. Well, Mr. Macklin, uh, well, we can't see you playing this game again. He said, and one of the doctors said, somebody told you this before, huh? I said, yeah, I've been told I, I can't play this game again. He said, does your family know? I said, no. No, I'm not telling my family. He said, you need to tell your family what's going on with you. No, I, I'll, I'll tell them when I'm ready. I don't want to worry them. I wasn't ready to share the weight totally yet. And so... I let it go for a while, and then my agent said, hey, you want to make a, some quick bucks overseas? He said, why don't you go to the Philippine Islands and play against those short guys over there and make a ton of money for a few months? <laughs> he didn't tell me the average temperature was 120 degrees. <laughs> I collapsed the first day. <laughs> and then the coaches in the train said, Mr. McLean, uh, we just wanted to let you know that we're going to have to send you back to the United States. Because if you go down one more time, you won't get up. <laughs> and then all of a sudden, my agent called my family. I'm in the Philippines, damn near dying, and my family gets this 10-way conference call, had family intervention to get me to let it go. And that was the time I was able to share the weight. I had to let them all know what I was going through, what I went through. They had no idea the pain and suffering I went through. They said, why didn't you just tell us? I said, because I didn't want to worry you. I didn't want you to be concerned. I could do this. I can handle this on my own, so I thought. But I was making it worse by not telling them. So I had to learn to share the weight with my family, to let the, they, my mom said something to me uh, before she died, when she had cancer. 
And she said, Pastor, you can identify with this. He said, she said, now look, I got cancer, but I'm not sick. She said, but whatever you do, don't tell people the church. She said, church folk will kill you. <laughs> I said, mama, yeah, now I mean it now. Don't you tell nobody the church, because church folk will kill you. She said, I can't have nobody going around saying, you know, I had a brother that had cancer, and, and he died two days later. You know, she said, don't you tell, I tell nobody that. And so I was, I was kind of the same way. I didn't want nobody to know, because nobody knew what happened to me in the NBA, all they know is I played, what, almost four and a half years, you know, never got cut, never got beat out. And everybody just assumed, some said I got, it, got injured, some said I just got cut. But I couldn't play because I wasn't physically able to play. And if I had known a long time ago, through my father and other family members, the family history, we had family unions like everybody else. Isn't that the perfect time? to talk about family illnesses? All of y'all go to family reunions. Do you talk about illnesses? Do you talk about sicknesses in your family? What's hereditary? What your ancestors and forefathers and mothers died from? You gotta talk about these things. You have to share the weight. Because yes, we're men, yes, we're strong. Yes, we take on a lot. But if you don't share the weight, it makes your problem even worse. And then I had another shock in my life, you know, I'm a single man. And all of a sudden, to a single man, prostate, prostate cancer's it. So when I was diagnosed with stage one prostate cancer, I shared the weight this time. I told my family this time. And right away I said, don't y'all dare tell the people the church. Because <laughs> church folk will kill you. So I shared the weight this time with my prostate cancer. And you know, when you hear the big C word, I mean, you know, that, that's it, you know. And so I told Dr. James Morris, I said, man, just go ahead on and take this thing out. It ain't nothing but a traffic cop anyway. So that was my, my attitude towards it. You know, I'll be okay. But I was able to share the weight. And my message to you today is, Share the weight, not only with your family, go ahead, share the weight with others that you know. I, I can't tell you how many lives I probably saved just by telling people, well, I had it too, you know? And if they tell me they, they had cancer of any sort, I don't say, oh man, oh, I'm, I'm so sorry for you, it's a deal. I always say, okay, you got cancer, you're not sick, you're still responsible for chicken wings on Sunday. For the football games, just make sure you bring them. I know you got cancer, but make sure you bring your chicken wings like you're supposed to. Okay, so share the weight with your family. Let them in. It's part of the healing process. Okay, your attitude towards your sicknesses and your illness is part of your healing. If you got a positive outlook, a positive attitude, you will, your chances of healing are great. It increases 10,000%. And your family and your closest friends are the one the ones that can help you get to that point because they're stronger than you think. They don't think they're gonna fall apart because you're falling apart. They're stronger than you think, especially you married men with your wives, those are your anchors, okay? My anchors is my brothers and sisters and whatever girl I'm dating at that time, okay? And I'm single so I can, I, I can do that. But anyway, but this is the way, get screened, Get your annual checkups. Tell those closest to you what the results are. Discuss those results, okay? Don't be afraid of the uncomfortable tests out there. Share the weight as part of the healing process. And it's your responsibility, your responsibility to make sure, sure you tell others who are not part of your family, you know, about being proactive, being physically active, eating correctly, excuse me, doing all the things you need to do to stay healthy and live a long life. I've been blessed with many gifts. And I didn't know what that weight meant. And I, I wondered, how did my father deal with that weight all the time? 
He was so strong to me. He was my mentor, my hero. And I always wondered, how he handle this? Why, what, what did he do to go through it? Until one day I was seven years old, I woke up in the middle of the night to go to the bathroom, and I heard a loud voice. That's the first time I heard my father praying out loud, and he didn't see me. And I sat there on the step, and I heard my father pray. It was a prayer for help, a prayer for guidance, a prayer for overcoming what he was going through. That's part of sharing the weight. He called on his help from divine being. And that I knew then that me and my weight had to come from a greater help and had to share that weight with him first. And then I shared the weight with others. I knew then his, I'm his baby boy. And I hope I made him proud, which he told me I did, that I can now share the weight with all of you. I just want to say thank you for having me and uh, continue to enjoy the conference. It's one of the best I've seen. I've been to conferences all over the country. This is by far one of the best, well organized, well, well financed. Uh, the people are great. And any chance you get, no matter how small, how insignificant, even if it's just one person, even if you don't know that person, take the time and share the weight. Thank you very much.